I first met Bruno Latour in the 1990s uh, when I lived in Paris and when Barbara van der Linden and I invited Bruno to the exhibition Laboratorium in Antwerp in 1999, um, Bruno had never curated an exhibition until then and came up. And we felt it's kind of important to get Bruno into the world of exhibitions. We were very inspired by uh, Lyotard's exhibition Les Immateriaux and thought maybe something similar could happen. And Bruno came up with this wonderful idea of the tabletop experiment. Little did we know that Bruno would then go on in such an amazing way to curate uh, many more exhibitions, uh, Iconoclash, Parliament of Things, and so on at the ZKM uh, in uh, Karlsruhe. Bruno Latour from 1982 to 2006 was professor at the Centre de Sociologie de l'Innovation at the École Nationale Supérieure des Mines in Paris and for various periods visiting professor at UCSD, the London School of Economics, and also at Harvard University. From 2006 to 2015, he has been a professor at Sciences Po in Paris, where he invented and created the Media Lab to seize the chance actually offer to social theory by the spread of digital methods, and together with Valérie Pierre, uh, a new experimental program in art and politics, the SPEAP, was started. A new presentation of the social theory, uh, which he has developed with his colleagues in Paris, is available at Oxford University Press under the title Reassembling the Social, an Introduction to Actor Network Theory. Bruno will be giving a talk today about institutions uh, before joining then a conversation with Tino Segal and myself on the transformation of the art institution. Tino Segal uh, was part of several marathons before, of course, the Manifesto Marathon, where, uh, together with uh, Eric Hobsbawm and many others, he discussed uh, the future or non-future of manifestos. Tino originally studied political economics and dance and crossed over to the visual arts in 2000. He achieved international recognition for his experimental work through many, many exhibitions at the Venice Biennale, the Documenta, the Guggenheim Museum, the Tate Modern in London. For Tino, an artwork consists of a live encounter between an artwork and a viewer, and he connects very much to what we discussed before with Kim and Dorothea and quoting also the Fan Palace, uh, because Segal does not make objects. He creates situations within the museum space in which interpreters enact choreographed actions and occasionally converse with visitors. These encounters offer the visitor a wholly unique experience of a live artwork. Tina was also instrumental in making the Swiss Pavilion happen, and so it's wonderful that we can continue this today, this discussion. And please give first now a very, very warm welcome to the great Bruno Latour. Thank you, uh, Anne Sulrik. I have a tie to look more like an artist, but uh, not like Gilbert and George. And uh, I'm very pleased to be uh, with Tino because he deals with immaterial choreographies, and I am afraid I'm going to deal with immaterial speech act. I'm going to talk about the institution and about the notion of transformation, I'm afraid, as an academic, which is my medium. In the program in political art in Sciences Po, which I created, we always insist that all media have to be resonating with one another, a lesson which can be said to have been learned from Anne Sulrich from the beginning. So my medium is argument said in a certain tone. And uh, the one I'm going to uh, present today is uh, a slogan, which might seem a bit strange, but no transformation without institution. And uh, of course, it might resonate uh, a slightly like uh, another one, which is very famous in political science, which is no taxation without representation. But it has some sort of connection in the sense that I've been studying for many years, including an exhibition we did with Anne Sulrik in 2001, in, in 2002 in uh, Karlsruhe, Clash, the strange difficulty of critique to understand transformation. So one of my sub-arguments 
is that there has been in the last 30 years probably a sort of exhaustion of a certain definition of critique which has made the connection with transformation not only impossible but as if critique was the opposite of transformation. And I, that's what I want to uh, explore. So no transformation without institution would sort of have a subtext, something which is strange, that we should cherish institution, learn to cherish institution. Not only the museum institution in which we are, and I thank those who organize this thing here, but many other type of institution, because transformation, and I think Francois Julien must have talked about that today, what he called transformation silencieuse, is also always passing through some sort of choreography, which is why I'm very happy to be with Tino, something which is very difficult to capture in normal social science. This is why uh, Hans Rick mentioned the actor network theory, which is a strange subset of sociology, which is interested also in the way things transit from one institution to the next without ever jumping to some sort of bigger or higher global level, society or the globe or the global, etc. Always like an ant, this is why it's called ant, because it's myopic like an ant, you move like this to, 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 without ever seeing things from above. Something which we try to actually re-articulate in the exhibition we do now in April at ZKM, which is called Reset. So the reason why this is strange is that institution and transformation in some of the history of the modern, and Dorothea mentioned avant-garde a minute ago, is of course uh, one clear case, uh, seems to be opposed. I mean, it seems to be that in science, in art, you know that very well, in politics, in religion, it's only if you are out of the institution, at the margin of the institution, or criticizing the institution, that the institution, that the sort of mobilization of innovation and transformation can occur. I'm an academic, and many times I despair of ever modifying the institution in which I am, even though I've been a, a vice a director of my, my school. And many of you here know that the temptation is very strong to despair of the institution, be it the church or uh, unions or whatever. But, and it's fair, because sometimes it's very boring. Yet, we have to ask the question, how much of this boredom, which is this sort of continuous uh, sort of sclero sclerose, we say in French, uh, ossified definition of the institution comes from those who want the transformation without the innovation, without the institution. In other words, what is the responsibility of the intellectual or the uh, intelligentsia in general in adding to the burden of the institution the inability to be an agent of transformation. And that's something which worries me, because you have then this very sort of common idea that you have to be out of the institution at the margin, and that's where the forces of transformation are. Then the institution moves, then it's ossified again, then you have to start again. And there is this sort of rhythm in the history of modernity, not only art, but also, as you know, in architectures, in science, of course, in philosophy. Many times this argument comes, comes, comes back. So my argument is, is, can we do better? Can we sort of get the creativity inside the definition of the institution itself? And for that, I have to turn to the great philosopher, uh, which has been the inspiration of much of my work in the last years, which is Whitehead, where the difference between institution and transformation comes from a certain philosophical idea about substance. I mean, it looks very strange, but I deal, this is my medium argument, so you have to bear with me. I'm sorry, I have no film, I have no music. I mean, <laughs> this is immaterial. But I think the choreography is understandable, right, you know. Which, is, which has to do with uh, the difference between 
substance and subsistence. Substance is supposed to last. And what lasts as is continuous, it's there, it's stable. And then transformation is always sort of antonym, it's, it's always against it. Subsistence, on the other hand, is what you need to constantly maintain. Subsistence is precisely what lasts through what does not last. And that's where the institution sit. The institution is exactly at the point where it constantly modifies through what does not last, something which is inherited, inheritance is the great expression of Whitehead, and which then subsists. But subsisting is not the opposition, the opposite of transformation. Subsistence and transformation is the same movement by which you inherit. Of course, Whitehead makes it a very, very deep philosophical argument about everything. But I think you can easily, in the context here, understand that it can be used for local, <laughs> more local uh, argument. And if you translate the no transformation without institution, it means you always have to ask the question, what is the small medium for which the inheritance passes from one to the other so that something subsists? Now, of course, this was not a question we had to take on, uh, on board before because the institution seemed very strong and critique and the capacity of innovation weak. Now, the problem is that the institution now are very weak. They have been finally very weakened. And uh, the question then for our generation is probably very different from what it was at the time when critique was a sort of... Uh, necessary position for someone coming to the art or philosophy or, um, or, or, or science. Suddenly, we are, like Hannah Tsing uh, says in an amazing book, on, on, uh, in the ruin. We have to learn to live in the ruins. And learning to live in the ruins requires pretty much a different definition of institution than uh, what we had uh, before. Suddenly, we write <laughs> with some sort of puzzlement that the institution have to be uh, cherished. So the difference between uh, subsistence and substance, it seems very abstract, but I'm sure you can imagine for another body itself is an institution of extreme complexity which lasts only because of its constant renewal by things that don't last. And if, if the body was not instituted in that sense, it would not uh, last. And, of course, the same thing for the many uh, other aspects in science. Science, of course, is the case I'm most interested in because the institution of science is under attack. And people imagine that you could have objectivity and respect for science without the institution of science. And, of course, it's impossible. If you destroy the institution of science, the polity of science will destroy also the objectivity. There is no objectivity flowing around out of the institution of science. And the, so science is one of the institutions to cherish. It sounds strange, uh, probably, <laughs> to say that we have to come to terms with this strange expression of cherishing our institution, because this is not the modernist tradition. But we are not in a modernist period. We are in the Anthropocene. We are in a time living in the ruins. And suddenly we realize that we need very, very fragile, this very complex and extraordinary fragile uh, choreography, to use again this term, to maintain uh, something which is not going to disappear uh, with us, so to speak. So this is what I had to say uh, to introduce the discussion with Tino and Hansuri. Thank you very much for having me here. Yeah.